Winemaking is the intentional transformation of grape juice into wine through fermentation. The job of a winemaker, the way I see it, is to choreograph the creation of the wine in the bottle from the time you choose a vineyard to determine when it's picked to look at the whole vision of what you want from a particular vineyard and make that happen both in the vineyard and the winery. Viticulture and winemaking are inextricably linked, but we can consider the winemaking process as beginning with the decision of when to pick. The decision to pick is really, really important. That's probably the most critical part of the whole winemaking process. Factors in deciding when to pick include the amount of sugar and acid in the grapes, impending weather, and the availability of tank space in the winery. Approaches to harvest vary, but the primary goal is to ensure that the fruit is kept cool and intact and arrives quickly to the winery. So we get started picking grapes at about midnight. Everything's hand harvested into small quarter ton lug boxes. We'll bring them into the winery, weigh them, and then put them into a cold room. At that point, we'll begin processing. Sorting is done by hand or mechanically using equipment designed to remove unwanted material. We take the quarter ton bin, we'll dump it onto a table, we'll go through and have four to six people hand inspecting the clusters, then we destem the fruit. We may choose to leave some as whole cluster, which we'll then dump into the tank. For Pinot Noir, we begin the destemming process and then we go through and we individually sort the berries. For red wines, winemakers must decide whether to destem grapes or ferment the bunches as whole clusters and whether or not to deliberately crush the berries. We aim for minimal crushing of the berries. Having whole berries, we get a slight carbonic maceration effect where we're actually having the berries break down and release specific strawberry and grassy hay flavors that are really pretty in the wine. When I'm making red wine, it's very much variety specific. Pinot Noir and Zinfandel, in both, I include some whole clusters because I want a very long extended fermentation time and that's a tool to attain that. Syrah, Cabernet Sauvignon, I tend to destem them 100%. There is no single right way to make a wine. Two outstanding producers just as often come to opposite conclusions regarding any individual decision. The key to quality winemaking lies in experience, intuition, and an understanding of how the complex interaction of hundreds of choices can lead to a desired result. The fundamental difference between red wine making and white wine making is that with white wines, the juice is separated from the skins and the seeds before fermentation. For white wines, a bladder or pneumatic press is often used. It's a membrane that inflates from one side of this big tube like a can, pressing the grapes up against a channeled screen, and then the juice comes out of the press. White grapes can be whole bunch pressed, or they can be crushed or destemmed before pressing. We don't like a lot of phenolic extraction in white wines, so you go direct to a press, you press very gently, and you'll separate the juice from the skins and the seeds as quickly as possible. If your stylistic preference is for wine for a little more body and flavor, you might destem it, leave it on the skins for a while, anywhere from a few hours to a day or more, to extract things from the skins. For rosé, red grapes may go directly to the press and be handled like white wine. Alternatively, rosé can be made from sagne, or juice drawn off a tank of red grape must after a short maceration. By definition, red wine is made by fermenting with the skins and the seeds present. All of the color in wine comes from the skins. The tannins, the spice compounds come from the skins and the seeds. So with red fermentation, you ferment first and press later. We'll do that with a basket press. So it's a small basket press with a single plunger and basically give them a little squeeze and the juice comes out. The length of skin contact prior to pressing a red wine depends on grape variety, fruit quality, and intended wine style. With Mountain Cabernet, tannin is a big factor in our wines. So our grapes come in with a lot of tannin, a lot of intensity, and the time that they spend on the skins is where all of that flavor comes into the wine. So that pressing decision is really, really key. Age-worthy wines made from healthy grapes often spend more time on the skins, while lighter styles of wine may be pressed earlier. Once the fruit is processed, the juice or must is transferred to fermentation vessels, which come in a variety of sizes and may be made of stainless steel, wood, or concrete. In the case of white wines, we use exclusively barrels, barriques, 225 liter French oak barrels. For reds, we have two different techniques. We can use stainless steel open top fermenters, or we actually have some wood open top fermenters as well. The size and material of the vessel impact the temperature of fermentation. Many modern tanks are equipped with cooling jackets to provide more control. 
In primary fermentation, sugar is converted to carbon dioxide and alcohol. Winemakers track its progress by measuring the bricks level, or density of the must. In general, the amount of alcohol there is about 0.6 times the level of sugar that came into the winery. So if you come in at 24 degrees bricks, you're going to get a 14.5% alcohol wine. Yeast can come from a variety of sources. You can buy cultured yeast, which had been selected from a fermentation where somebody liked the attributes and propagated and made it available. Or you can rely on the ambient yeast in a winery. Fermentation is typically carried out by the wine yeast Saccharomyces, which is adapted to the conditions of high sugar and alcohol. Yeast require sufficient nutrients and oxygen to thrive. Otherwise, stuck fermentations or reductive aromas can occur. Prior to fermentation, I always have a full juice panel run by a local lab, which gives me the, all the organic acids, the nutrients, a number of other things I like to look at. We're not directed by numbers, but they give you information that's valuable. Chemical analysis of the juice exposes deficiencies that can be supplemented by nutrient and acid additions. Fermentation produces heat, and the range of temperatures throughout the process can impact the flavors of the resulting wine. With red grapes, you really want to get a lot of heat early in the fermentation. That's how you extract color and tannin into the wines. Some people prefer lower fermentation temperatures to extend the fermentation or to keep the wines more on the fruity side. While red wine fermentations reach peak temperatures in the 80s or low 90s Fahrenheit, white wine fermentations are cooler, especially in the case of aromatic wines. The physical contact of juice and skins is key to extraction. For red wines, this is manipulated through cap management. As the yeast start to convert the sugar into alcohol, the juice is released from the grapes and all the skins are lifted up to the top of the tank by the carbon dioxide that's being produced. So one thing that we want to do is we want to come in and mix the cap to regulate the amount of temperature that's built up in the tank. During the fermentation, the tank is typically mixed one to three times per day, with practices adapted to vintage and grape variety. You can do that with a pump over, where you're actually pumping the juice from the bottom of the tank and then gently wetting the cap on the top. You can also do it with a punch down, where you're submerging the cap down into the juice, and you'll get more or less extraction depending on how you choose to manage your cap. Once fermentation is complete, the new wine is drained off of the skins. This free-run wine is often higher quality than the wine obtained from pressing the skins. There's a secondary fermentation that some people do, some people don't, particularly in white wines, called malolactic fermentation. What is malolactic fermentation? It's the conversion of malic acid to lactic acid with malolactic bacteria. There are stylistic reasons for doing it with some white wines, such as Chardonnay, because you want the reduction acidity or you're looking for the diacetyl buttery character can impart. But primarily, it's a stability tool. For aromatic white wines, varietal flavors are often preserved by preventing secondary fermentation through low temperature, sulfur additions, or sterile filtration. Elevage is the term that we use for the period of time after fermentation before a wine is bottled. Generally for red wines and for barrel fermented white wines, it's the time that they spend in barrel where they might be stirred, racked, topped, all those things that we can do in barrel. Depending on wine style, Elevage can last anywhere from a few months to several years. Historically, barrels were just a vessel to allow wine to mature in. One person can handle a barrel. That's why 50 to 70 gallons tends to be the size range in most areas in the world. But it's a convenient aging container. The proportion of new oak, toast level, and origin of the wood all impact the flavor imparted by the barrel. But even an older barrel that has no flavor at all of wood anymore has a great effect on the wine. Stirring, or batonnage, increases contact with the leaves, which are yeast cells and other solids that have settled from the wine. Stirring is a great way to bring flavor into a white wine. All of our Chardonnay is fermented in barrel, and so as those yeast die, they settle down to the bottom of the barrel, and by stirring the barrel, we're mixing them back in with the wine where all of the contents of the yeast cells are being released, and those are the polysaccharides and mannoproteins that make the wine really thick and delicious. Because it's a small vessel, every time you open that bung on the barrel, you're letting a tiny bit of oxygen in. So you get slightly more oxidative aging in a barrel than you would in a large tank. Topping replaces wine lost to evaporation during aging. 
we call the evaporation from a barrel the angel's share. So that's wine that is going out into the air and the barrel is becoming lower and lower. So we have to top that up with fresh wine in order to prevent oxygen from getting into the barrel. Racking occurs several times during the life of a wine. Racking is where you take all of the wine from one lot or block of grapes and you pump all the barrels out into a tank, you clean all your barrels, and then you pump the wine back into the same barrels or different barrels, depending on the flavors you want. Blending can be done at any time during elevage. I like to let the wines age for at least eight months before I start blending. I think that is a good point to really see the long-term flavors and character of each wine. Winemakers blend wines from different grape varieties, vineyard sites, or styles to create a more complete wine. After fermentation, the biggest enemy of wine is access to oxygen. While wine may benefit from a small amount of oxygen, for most wines, protection from excessive oxidation is achieved with the addition of sulfur dioxide. Sulfur dioxide is a preservative that's been used in wine for hundreds of years. They used to burn sulfur wicks in barrels. Sulfur dioxide is antioxidant and it's also somewhat antimicrobial. Sulfur dioxide can be added at various points throughout the winemaking process, depending on the condition of the fruit and the style of the wine. As the sulfur stays in the wine, it reduces over time relatively very quickly. So each time we open the barrel, we'll check the sulfur and maybe we'll make a small addition. If you're in a rush to get them to market or if it's your preference, there are stability things you can do to the wines. Chilling, fining, filtration, there's lots of tools to get them market ready. Filtration is removing sediment from wine or removing yeast and bacteria. In some cases, the wine might be a little bit hazy, and then it's a winemaker's opinion that that haze can be a little bit bitter and a very loose filtration to clarify the wine will make it actually taste better. Sometimes filtration just comes down to a stability issue. If you bottle a wine and it has enough malic acid or enough residual sugar or not enough SO2 for something to go wrong in bottle, then you want to make sure that you've removed any yeast or bacteria that could um, become active once the wine has been bottled. Fining agents, such as egg whites or clay, may be used to improve the tannin structure, clarity, or aroma of a wine. Bottling is the last opportunity a winemaker has to influence wine quality. I don't want to bottle a wine until I feel that the wine has developed and reached its apogee in terms of balance and interest. And that can vary. It's not on a calendar. Every wine will develop differently. Bottling lines are complex, with many opportunities for error. It may not be the most romantic part of the process, but this overlooked aspect is essential to ensure quality. There are a number of faults that can affect wine quality, and as a winemaker, that's the last thing that you want to have happen to your wine. I think the biggest problem with most wineries is microbiological spoilage, which can occur from a variety of sources. And we try to be very careful, make sure our cooperage is clean and well-maintained, and keep the wines topped. Spoilage from undesirable yeast or bacteria can impart flaws, such as high levels of volatile acidity or barnyard aromas. Most microbial spoilage can be avoided through clean cellar practices. At low levels or when done intentionally, some wine faults may add interest to a wine. Cork taint, however, is always seen as a flaw, which has led to experimentation with cork alternatives. Beyond natural cork, there are agglomerated corks, there's lots of plastic closures, there's glass closures, and then, of course, screw cap. There are many options available to winemakers today. The same wine under different closures will vary in terms of consistency, rate of oxidation, and flavor. Cost, consumer perception, and convenience are also important factors. Patience is very important. You can't be an impatient person when you're making wine. Decisions are very long and slow. While the fundamental principles of winemaking are universal, practices vary by region, grape variety, and wine style, allowing winemakers to craft unique expressions. Every wine is a new experience. It's got its own journey, and if you listen carefully enough, it'll tell you what it wants to be and where it wants to go.